Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the first uh, dark matter detection parallel. Um, so a bit of housekeeping before we start, uh, I just put in the chat, uh, if you're giving um, a presentation today, uh, please make sure to upload uh, your slides to the agenda um, before your talk, if you can, there are a couple still missing. Um, if that's not possible, um, of course, upload them after the fact. If you have any, any problems uh, with permissions, for example, uh, for the Indico page for connecting, then please um, email um, the committee at lp-2021 at cern.ch. I'll put the, the, the email address for that in the chat and um, we'll be able to help you either get permissions to upload or upload, upload your slides for you. Um, can I just double check? People can hear me as well before <laughs> we start. Yes, we can hear you. Hold Great. On. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So um, then, a bit more housekeeping about the presentations uh, for the speakers. So um, to keep track of time, um, all the speakers today have fifteen minutes to speak and and five minutes for questions. Um, I will briefly interrupt uh, verbally. Uh, the speakers uh, to announce five minutes remaining and one minute remaining. Uh, I'll try to do that at the end of a, a slide, a slide transition to, to disrupt things uh, as little as possible, but please you know, keep continuing. This is just for you to, um, to be aware of things. Um, and aside from that, um, I'll, I'll let you get on with speaking. So uh, the first presentation we have uh, today is uh, Teresa Fruth, who will be talking us through the status of uh, LZ and, and, and simulation studies. Um, so can you share your slides for us, please? Yeah. I'll do that now. Great. Yeah, we can see those now. So you can go ahead when you're ready. Right. Great. Thank you. So my name is Teresa. I'm a postdoc at UCL. And today I'll give an update on LZ. LZ is, uh, or like Zeppelin, is a direct detection search for dark matter. And we're looking for the interaction of dark matter via nuclear recoils in our target medium, which is xenon. Um, and so if this incoming particle interacts via nuclear recoil, we expect to see scintillation light um, and we get free electrons as well, ionization electrons as well. The scintillation light we would detect with um, PMT arrays on the bottom and the top of the detector and the electrons we extract to the top of the detector using um, an electric drift field applied um, across the um, height of the detector. Once the electrons reach the top, they get extracted to a thin layer of gas where um, we get electroluminescence light and that we can detect. So we have two light signals we detect. The depth of the, of the interaction is um, indicated by seeing the time difference between those two signals, plus the second signal, the um, electroluminescent signal on the top has an XY hit pattern, which gives us the XY reconstruction. So we have 3D event reconstruction, which is really handy if you want to fiducialize your detector. And of course, as most, um, or almost all rare event searches, we need to go underground to get away from cosmic rays. And we're out in South Dakota at the Sanford Re Underground Research Facility, where the Ray Davis experiment took place and the latest experiment which took place there was of course LUX. So we're in the same cavern one mile underground. And LZ is not just the central detector, the TPC, which I already showed you on the first slide. The TPC lives inside of a cryostat vessel. So the inner cryostat vessel um, contains all, all our xenon. Then that sits inside of the outer cryostat vessel, which provides us with the vacuum insulation. Around that, we have an outer detector. So we have these tanks filled with um, scintillator. And then we have PMTs observing these tanks. And all of that is inside the water tank. Of course, there's some more infrastructure needed as well, like cable conduits to actually connect to your PMTs and readouts. The cathode high voltage is directly delivered um, here through this conduit. And then we have seen on lines coming in at the bottom of the detector as well. And on the next few slides, I'm going to, to go into detail on all of these components. So at the heart, of course, we have the time projection chamber, the TPC, which consists of these two PMT arrays on top and bottom. That's almost 500 PMTs 
um, of the three inch type Hamamatsu. Um, here you can see the top view of the PMT faces in the bottom array. And in between those two PMT arrays, we have our field cage that's in beautiful white here, such that we have good um, light collection efficiency. Embedded in this, um, TP, uh, in this field cage, we have four high voltage grids. So the, those were custom woven um, at Slack. And between the cathode, the gate and the anode, we get our drift and extraction regions. And then we have this bottom grid at the bottom to protect our PMT array. In between the TPC and the inner cryostat vessel it sits in, um, there's a thin layer of, of liquid xenon. And we want to make use of this um, layer of liquid xenon as a coincidence detector. So we have instrumented it. We have PMTs on, on this top here. So here you can see the sides of the PMTs, they're looking downwards. We have PMTs in the bottom of the detector. So if you remember, this was the high voltage feed through. So this is really at the bottom dome of, of the ICV, the inner cryostat vessel. And then we have these dome PMTs below the bottom PMT array. And we have lined the inner cryostat vessel in with these PTFE liners to again, have high light collection efficiency. Then on the outer detector, which I already mentioned um, earlier, we have these, these um, acrylic vessels surrounding the outer cryostat vessel, um, top, bottom, and on the sides. And that contains 17 tons of gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator. And again, we have PMTs, this time eight inch PMTs, so quite big ones, sitting in the water tank, observing this li liquid scintillator. And here again, we have anti-coincidence for gamma rays, but we also have neutron capture on the gadolinium. And then we get um, a range of gamma rays at about eight MeV in total. So the spot image really brings together um, all the physics in LC for our main WIMP search, a WIMP particle only um, expected to interact once, and then our V2 physics allowing us to um, veto both gammas and neutrons, um, which, which really helps reduce backgrounds. Of course, we don't only need the PMTs to de detect the light and the high voltage to extract electrons, we also need our detector medium. We have 10 tons of xenon. Those are krypton reduced at slack prior to being shipped to site to less than 300 ppq krypton per xenon. Um, and that uses gas chromatography. But we also have some um, purification online and that's done by circulating our xenon. So our xenon comes in from the bottom into the TPC and then it um, spills over the weir, goes back and into the xenon tower where we um, have this heat exchange because we need to um, convert our liquid xenon into gas such that we can use these circulation compressors here and pass the xenon through the getter, which is a hot, hot zirconium getter, to um, remove electronegative impurities, um, which allows us to have a higher electron lifetime than you might otherwise get due to outgassing from detector materials. And from the pictures, you could already guess that a lot of this has, or all of this has been constructed and assembled and commissioning is well underway. So our circulation system, which I showed you in the last slide, was already tested with this test um, cryostat, which is of the same height as the LZ cryostat, but of course a lot thinner. So it's quite a skinny one, but we demonstrated flow rates up to 600 SLPM, where 500 SLPM was the uh, goal for LZ. We have filled the detector with xenon gas and have cooled it down to just above liquid xenon temperatures. And we have, of course, checked that our PMTs after transport underground and this cool down are still functional. So here you can just see some waveforms of LED calibrations of the PMTs. I'm going to shift a bit towards physics and what you can expect to see from LZ now. Um, so first of all, of course, it's a rare event search backgrounds and our background expectations is, is super important. I've already talked a little bit about the shielding with by being deep underground, having the VTO detectors and the xenon purification. But of course, before building, before design or while designing it, 
we had a thorough material selection with radioacid campaigns and the screening paper, which has a lot of detail on those and many, many tables with the materials is linked up here. And during construction, we were very careful about radon daughters and dust plating out on surfaces, um, which is a real threat um, to, to set, getting more and more backgrounds. So we were very careful to really reduce those. Of course, um, but also we will get some um, events from materials from other backgrounds. Um, but here we have the advantage of having discrimination. So in Xenon, um, the, the signals for, for electron recalls and nuclear recalls have slightly different uh, ratios between um, ionization and scintillation. So from LAX here, this plot, can, you can see beautifully that electron recalls, which will be most of our backgrounds, have a higher ionization yield compared to the scintillation yield that lie up here. And this red band, the nuclear recalls, is where we would expect our signals. Additionally, I already mentioned the veto detectors and how powerful those are. Um, you can estimate from this, these plots on the right-hand side. So on the top, those are all simulations. So we have um, R squared versus Z, so the depth into the detector. And most of the events are towards the outside. The bottom plot shows you how much that reduces with the veto. And here we have additionally, through the 3D event reconstruction, we can fiducialize and get a very quiet center of the detector. And to estimate our sensitivity to various physics and especially our wind search, we use our simulation framework. So just a brief overview here. So we have our GN4 um, simulation framework, which has all our geometry um, and materials inside, and that's called Baccarat. And then we have energy deposits which we convert via using via the NEST noble element simulation technique to um, a detector response in S1 and S2 signal sizes, which then goes into our sensitivity analysis. We do have a secondary um, simulation chain, which really helps to look at specific events, specific po populations. And here we have optical simulations and electronics response simulation generating real waveforms, which then can just be fed into our normal event reflection framework, which is really useful. And that leads us to our expected background events. So this is for a thousand day science run, which is the estimated run for LZ, where we have um, on this slide, on the left-hand side, you can see an S1 and S2 space, all the events we would expect. And on the right-hand side, it's kind of uh, shown as background events in, in terms of electronic recalls and nuclear recalls and the different contributions to the backgrounds there. But what we can take from this is that we would expect most um, of our backgrounds to lie up here in the electron recall band. Um, to make it easier to see where we might expect a signal, we show here the 40 GeV WIMP where we would expect that. And boronate neutrinos um, would be super interesting to also see, which is kind of a background, but also a signal interesting to look for. This kind of shows that we have power, di powerful discrimination, but for us, it's really important to have a well calibrated background model because in the end we do a profile likelihood ratio analysis. So we compare every event we get through analysis um, to the backgrounds and see whether it's more signal or background like. And that leads to, um, that leads to a um, exclusion sensitivity projection um, here where you can compare to this Xenon 1 ton 2018 result and the Panda X 4 ton result from 2021 here. And that would be over a thousand life days projected to go to a minimum at 40 GeV of 1.4 times 10 to the minus 48 centimeters squared. We do want to do some other physics as well. And one, um, one obvious way to look at is to push further into the low mass um, dark matter range, so into GeV dark matter. We could enhance our sensitivity to the low mass um, region by um, lowering our coincidence requirement. So our S1, which is the smaller signal, really sets our detector threshold. And lowering the S1 coincidence requirement, um, if possible, would help us to push a little bit further. So you can see the dotted line here. That's that's the normal LZ curve and the black one 
here would allow us to push a little bit further into the space. But really big gains you can make when you go to S2 only analysis where you lose discrimination, but can go to lower thresholds. A very different search, but something we can still do is neutrinoless double beta decay. So here we're in the high energy ER region. Um, and so we're using the xenon isotope 136 xenon and um, it would show up as like a peak in our ER spectrum. Of course, it depends on um, whether our backgrounds conform with what we expect. But here over a thousand day lifetime film simulations um, shows you that we do expect to be competitive with current limits. And of course, uh, there's a lot of excitement about low energy ER band searches since the Xenon Montan result um, a few years back. And um, Elsie is really excited to get to probe that and see for any physics um, reasons for, for that for that excess scene. And so ER band searches, there are various things you can look for, mirror dark matter axions, um, axion-like particles. And here I'm showing just a plot for axion-like particles. There's a lot more in this paper up here. Um, and the LZ exclusion curve um, is project after a thousand day life, um, life run is projected down here. We also indicate if we would, were to see an excess where our three sigma evidence would lie. And of course, this is a big collaboration, bringing all of this together. We have 34 institutions, 250 scientists, engineers, and technical staff. And this was our hybrid collaboration meeting um, we managed to have in September. So overall, LZ construction and underground circulation test is complete. Um, our commissioning is well underway. And unfortunately, I can't take you, uh, tell you any more <laughs> than I showed in these slides but um, 2022 should be an exciting year for us. So thank you very much. Great, thanks for the talk, Susa. Um, so questions, I see that there's some already, people can put their hands up in the, in the Zoom, I'll uh, get to you. I think this one's from uh, Luciano, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for, for the nice talk. I have a quick question about the, the double beta sensitivity. So I assume that that your uh, that your uh, sensitivity depends quite a lot on the energy resolution that you can achieve at Q beta beta. Probably, well, uh, the, the experiment is focused to the low energy part. So uh, I, I don't know if uh, which kind of resolution you assumed for the high energy parts of the Q beta beta, and if it's uh, kind of uh, granted or if it's an R and D or if it can be improved. Of course. Having a better resolution here will mean to 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 make a stronger and stronger uh, signal. So that's that's a key parameter. So I wonder if there is any study or number that that you quote as reference for um, that energy resolution. Yeah, I think this the paper up, a linked up here has has the energy resolution. I'm I'm not sure I know by heart. I read <laughs> I read it again this morning. Um, but it was like if it. What I do remember is what what we expect. If it's it's slightly worse, it wouldn't impact it much. If it's a lot worse, we would get impacted um, a lot more. Of course, yeah, and of course, you're absolutely right. We're not um, we haven't um, focused on this region of the detector or this parameter space, but we have spent quite as in preparation of that paper, people have spent a lot of time looking at analysis in this region. And I think what really helps us is that a lot of the backgrounds here, um, would, we would expect multiple scatters where we're quite good to, to, to get rid of them then. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marco, you had a question? Uh, thank, thanks very much for the uh, very nice talk. Uh, you mentioned the simulation uh, at some point. Uh, and uh, I'm an outsider of the of the field, so uh, the question is rather uh, general. Uh, how how important is is simulation uh, uh, for for the uh, analysis, and uh, how much uh, uh, computational time, uh, in particular, do you uh, uh, foresee requiring uh, for this? So that, therefore, how how much do you rely on on, on sort of faster op optimized simulation techniques? Yeah, so it, it's really important for us because. Um, as we, when we do our final analysis, we use a um, profile likelihood analysis, which gets a um, background PDFs from produced from simulation. And of course validate, like we produce our simulations, we validate them against our detector backgrounds. But then um, that's, that's a really important ingredient. 
we do use this fast parametric chain here up here to to reduce the amount of CPU um, CPU we need, uh, and that does does really help. So this especially once you produce your energy deposits once, um, you can scale and you can um, just run the detector response tuning um, a lot more. Whereas this chain, which has the full optical simulations, um, is a lot more time intensive and computing intensive. Um, so I think here we're also looking into like, oh, could we use GPUs maybe? Um, could we use the full chain in the future rather than the, the fast chain? Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, I, I, I had come across uh, uh, some of these GPU uh, usages uh, uh, from, from LZ, so uh, good, good to hear, thanks. Um, and maybe one question for myself then, if you can. Uh, so you mentioned the uh, low energy uh, search. So it's mindful of the Xenon 1 ton excess. Um, is there anything public? Could you comment on um, LZ's plans for like mitigation and constraint of potential backgrounds like tritium and, and so forth? Yeah, I think one of the um, one of the background components which which are kind of difficult to constrain or where people have in the past th thought about how that could contribute in this region is argon 37. And actually, I think yesterday or maybe today, a paper should have been posted to archive on argon 37 and what we expect through cosmogenic activation in LZ to see. Um, so that, that should be an interesting one to keep an eye on in this region as well. So is the the expectation that this is not going to be a problem or is, that, is it that it'll be able to be constrained? Um, so we should be able to see it at, at, at the start. Um, and then, um, but hopefully, as there's, if there's no other sources of argon-37 and it's just the cosmogenic ones, it will decay away and it should not be a problem. But, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I don't see any other hands. So uh, thanks again, Teresa. We'll move on to the uh, next talk, which is from uh, Luciano, who will uh, talk to us about directionality for nuclear recalls in a liquid argon TPC. So we can see your slides. So okay, ahead, perfect. Right. Can you also hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I I'm gonna start. So thanks, thanks a lot for, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, well, my slides are okay now it's it's going so the, the 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 red program originates within the dark side program uh within the uh, global argon dark matter collaboration so dark side is looking for uh dark matter in the form of wimps using uh by employing dual phase tpcs uh filled with low radioactivity argon at the grand sasso laboratory so i'm going to spend i'm not going to spend so much on on this because you will see uh the talks after mine by by Gemma describing the activities and the, the perspectives of the of the dark side program also i don't need to spend time to describe the working principle of a tpc because it was nicely described in the in the, in the previous talk so again you have a, a scintillation signal which is prompt which is followed by a secondary signal made by ionization electron that are collected by an electric field and the secondary signal comes with a delay which is due to the drift time from the interaction site to the to the liquid gas uh, interface where the electroluminescence takes place of course it's clear that uh, in, in a conclusive discovery of dark matter will benefit very much from a, a clear signature a smoking gun signature more convincing than a simple excess of unexplained nuclear recoil events and, and one of those smoking guns could be the directionality uh, actually the, the the sun with the solar system brings uh, the sun and the solar system they they travel in the galaxy they go in the direction of the sinus uh, constellation so we expect to have a wimp an apparent wind wind uh, wind wind coming uh, through us and this originates uh, a directionality signal for wimps which converts into a pattern in the angular distribution of nuclear recoils which should be observed by uh, the direct dark matter search experiments of course this is a statistical effect but uh, to, to separate isotropic versus directional uh, signal uh, in principle only a few hundreds of events will be will be needed the interesting part of this of this game is that in principle uh, a, a dual phase tpc may be sensitive to, to direction 
And this comes through the mechanism of columnar recombination. So if you look at the, at the, at the part on the, on, the, on the right hand side, if the track is kind of uh, uh, parallel with respect to the electric field, the drifting electron will, will drift uh, through the column made by electron ion pairs. So they will have a higher recombination probability than in the other case. In this case, there is more recombination. So the scintillation signal is announced and the uh, secondary ionization signal is depleted. Well, the opposite takes place if the track is kind of perpendicular with respect to the electric field. So there is a balance which changes between scintillation and ionization in the case of different direction of the track. And this is interesting because uh, the Xene experiments, they, they had some intriguing hints. So they saw a difference of, uh, uh, in the behavior of S1 for parallel and perpendicular. And this is not significant from the statistical point of view, but it actually deserves a, a more detailed scrutiny. So, uh, RED was actually designed to address this issue. So of course, how you do that, uh, you want to produce nuclear recoils in the energy range, which is of interest for dark matter searches, having known energy and direction within a TPC. And you do that by using a neutron beam. So we produce a neutron beam using a nuclear reaction. So from a primary life lithium-7 beam accelerated from a tandem accelerator in the Laboratorio Nazionale del Sud in Catania, and this gives a neutron and, and a beryllium seven on a, on, a, on a proton target. So what we do actually is that we send neutrons to scatter to the TPC and we want to detect the, 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 the outgoing neutron after the, the, the scattering. Of course, the, the kinematic, it's, it's two body. So everything is known. And if you fix the direction of the scattering neutron, you know the energy and the direction of the, of the recoil uh, argon, argon decay, argon, argon 40. So that's, that's the conceptual layout that we put in place. So we send a lithium beam, which is 28 MeV, on a, a basically proton target, so plastic, CH2. And this originates uh, an interaction which produces beryllium-7 and neutrons. Uh, we can detect the beryllium-7 by an appropriate silicon telescope detector. So we can tag the neutron event by event. The neutrons, they travel and they go to the TPC. And we complete the kinematics by detecting the neutron emerging from scattering at, at a specific angle. So we have three uh, detectors, silicon telescope, TPC, and, uh, and, and the neutron uh, spectrometer. And this is how the real thing happens in, in the, uh, takes place. In, uh, it's looking like in the real life. So the target is it's here in a vacuum chamber, which also hosts the, the silicon telescope. There is the TPC, and then there is an array of scintillation detectors, which, uh, which I'm going to discuss uh, in one minute. So that's uh, the, the, real pic the, the picture of the real assembly at the Laboratorio Nazionale del Sud in, uh, in Catania. So let, let me spend a few words about the, the ingredients, so the detectors that's, that we use in this, uh, in this project. First of all, the, the, the main one is the, the, is the TPC. So it's, it's a dual phase uh, liquid argon TPC, and it's a kind of, uh, it's a small, Thing it's a uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, my my camera is not my okay okay I cannot see my uh, my video okay now I can see so the, there is a miniature it's 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 a small TPC it's kind of five by five by six centimeters so it's 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 a miniaturized version of the TPC which is being developed for for dark side twenty k and the gas pocket it's seven millimeter thick. So as the dark side TPC, it's read out by, by silicon photomultipliers. So there are two types of silicon photomultipliers on the top and, and on the bottom of the TPC uh, made by 24 devices. They are read out individually on the top in order to improve the sensitivity, the resolution on, on the XY, and they are read out in group of six in the bottom, in the bottom tile. So as, as mentioned in the previous talk, a TPC, a dual phase TPC allows for a 3D event reconstruction. So X and Y, X and Y are known from the S2 pattern on the top silicon PMs. So you see, you check where the secondary signal takes place on uh, this matrix of uh, silicon multiple photomultipliers. And the Z coordinate is given by the drift time uh, between the interaction sites and the multiplication region. So how long the the, the electrons uh, take to travel from the interaction site to the multiplication phase. Also, uh, argon uh, features a well-known, uh, very, very efficient 
electron recoil, nuclear recoil discrimination by using the pulse shape, the time profile of the scintillation signal. So we typically use a signal, which is the, 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 the ratio between the fast scintillation and the total scintillation. And this allows for a very efficient separation of nuclear recoils and, and electrons. So before putting this, this detector under the beam irradiation, we, we made quite a, a long work of char characterization. This, this took, took place in, uh, in Naples in 2019. So we calibrated with laser, gamma, and neutron sources. So to, 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 to make sure that, that we, we know the detector and we keep it under control, we also demonstrated that the system with the silicon PMs is stable on the time scale of months, which was not, uh, was not uh, trivial before. And uh, the, the light yield, it's about 10 photo electron per kV, and it was demonstrated to be stable within a uh, within couple of percent. So uh, we, we were confident that, that uh, the TPC is, uh, is working fine before of the radiation, and also that the performance in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the performance for the regionality search were, were good enough to allow to, uh, to check for the, uh, for the signal, for the uh, hints by, by seeing. So the electron lifetime was better than one millisecond, which is much longer than the drift time in the in the TPC. Uh, we have more than twenty photoelectrons per electron as uh, ionization yield, and 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 so on. So everything was was in place. The other two detectors, as I said, there is a silicon telescope. So it's a pair of two silicon detectors, one thin and one one thick, which is deployed close to the targets within the vacuum scattering chamber in order to tag beryllium-7. So beryllium is produced together with the neutron. So measuring, detecting beryllium means that you have a neutron going towards the, the TPC. So the geometry was arranged such to allow for an event by event tagging of, of the neutron. And the second and the last component is the neutron spectrometer. It's made by liquid scintillator cells, so to, to have a high efficiency for, for neutrons. Those are made by EJ309, which features a, a, a fairly good neutron gamma discriminator, discrimination. So they, they allow for separation of neutron and, and gammas. And they, they offer a time resolution, which is better than, uh, it's a sub nanosecond uh, time resolution. So we arrange those detector in a kind of ring structure in order to tag Argo recoils in the TPC, which takes place, which have the same energy, but takes place uh, with a different direction with respect to the electric field. So argon recoils going at zero degrees, so it means in the same direction as the electric field, 20, 40, and perpendicular to the plane of the electric field. Five then minutes. Have, pardon me? Five minutes. Okay, then uh, uh, it's putting all together. So we, we had a two week beam time in February, 2020. So right before the main lockdown, fortunately. And we sent uh, 28 MeV lithium on, on a target and the system, so that the, ang the angles of the system were tuned in order to select records of about 70 keV in the TPST. And in principle, we could change the, the energy of the nuclear records we select by changing only the beam energy. So the tagging of the neutrons uh, in the TPC by using this beryllium coincidence worked out uh, very well. And we could collect, we could demonstrate it and collect a fairly large sample of argon recoils in the TPC. Now let's look for a signal. What do we care about? We care about having a single argon recoil, so an argon recoil induced by neutron, having uh, the same energy, but different angle with respect to the electric field direction. So we want to check whether recoils going in a direction behave si differently or similarly than recoils going uh, in another direction with respect to the electric field. And this is done by selecting uh, three-fold coincidences, so events having silicon signal, TPC signal, and neuron spectrometer. Then, thanks to the pulse shape discrimination and the timing, so the time of flight, we could clean up uh, very much from, from background. So this is the sequence of uh, selection steps, and the main peak here is made by a signal, so they are single scattering, uh, uh, neutron scattering producing nuclear recoils in the TPC, and the residual background, which is made by accidentals, inelastic uh, uh, reactions to excited states, and, and multiple scattering. So in order to, in, to interpret the model, the, the data, 
one needs a directional model. So the two, two historical models are the Thomas ML, in which, uh, which is appropriate for very short track in which there is no directional dependence. So it's called a box model. And in the opposite, if the track it's approximated like an infinite long track, uh, you have the Jaffe Burke's uh, uh, model. And the recent model which, which we are taking uh, into consideration is this from Cautadella et al, which has this functional form for the directional dependence. And it's controlled by a single parameter R, which is actually the aspect ratio here of the uh, electron ion cloud. Of course, if R it's equal to one, we get back to the Thomas Emel uh, model. So there is no directional effect. So in the case there is no directionality, this will be the detector response if you have non-energetic nuclear recoils. So the size of the blobs, it's given by the fluctuations, either physical or instrumental. Then uh, let's switch on a directionality effect. So R, we set R equal to, and in this case, the S2 S1 balance, it uh, changes differently for um, parallel or perpendicular recoils. So if you have parallel recoils, you enhance S1 and deplete S2 and vice versa. So the effect of the directional dependence is to change the balance between the S1 and S2 with respect to the uh, null signal. And this is what we actually did by using our data. So we run an unbeaten maximum likelihood fit with all the data, the double coincidence and the triple coincidences. So this fit has uh, as a components that the signal, uh, the multi-scattering and the random coincidences backgrounds, and all the PDF for the fits were either simulated or uh, taken from the data using the sidebands. Uh, the model, it's, it's fairly complicated. It has a number of nuisance parameters, uh, some of which are instrumentals, and they are, of, of course, constrained with pool terms because we have calibrations and independent measurements. Here at the end of the day, you want to get rid of all the parameters, but, but R, which is how our uh, measurement of directionality. This is the output fit. So those are the different data sets, 90, 40, 20, zero, and the other detector at 90 degree with the best fit of a late. And our R unfortunately is compatible with one. So it's compatible with uh, no effect from directionality. So from the data, we don't see any difference by uh, selecting nuclear recoils of 70 kV at different uh, directions uh, with respect to the electric fields. So we, we, we don't conform, unfortunately, the, the hint by, by seeing at this level of sensitivity. So this brings me to, to my conclusion. We, uh, we run uh, a project which is called REDS, which has a double value of physics experiment looking for directionality, but also as a nice test bench for the technologies that are being developed for, for dark side 20K. So we irradiated a, 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 a miniaturized TPC with nu neutrons produced by a primary reaction at the Laboratory Nazionale del Sud in, uh, in Catania. So we tuned the system to 70 kV nuclear recoils, which is, uh, let's say, in the range of interest for, for dark matter. And we analyzed the data according to this Cautadella directionality model, which has this single parameter as, uh, as output, so the aspect ratio of the clouds. Unfortunately, we found no evidence for direct, any directionality effect at the level of a uh, few percent. So the best fit for R is compatible with the R equal one, which will be uh, completely isotropic. Still, uh, of course, we, we, we can go on and the information about sensitivity of course is crucial for the design of the next generation experiments and specifically Argo from the Global Argo and Dark Matter collaboration. And in the future, we, we, are, we are planning to use the same TPC by RED to study uh, the low energy response of, uh, of a liquid argon TPC. So to check the response of the system to nuclear recalls uh, of a few kV, uh, which, uh, which is of interest, of course, for the low mass uh, dark matter searches. And this, uh, this run is currently under preparation uh, in Catania. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, any questions, Luciano? So, while people may be thinking, I'll just ask a, a, a point about the uh, R value you quote here on the final slides. Was the uncertainty um, that you quoted uh, purely statistical, or does this include systematic effects? No, here it's driven by, by statistics. Mm -hmm. So we, we could improve a little bit by, by having a longer run, but at, at some point, uh, uh, well, it's, it, 
I wouldn't say it's uh, you, you can gain very much. It's kind of 50-50. Yeah, so are there any sort of systematic effects that can sort of fake uh, um, uh, signal directionality or, or, or limit you here in this measurement? Well, actually, uh, the, 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 the biggest one is that the TPC is not a point. So neutrons having different directions have a slightly different energy. So this is changing S1 and mimics. Well, it doesn't mimic, but it has it, it can have a systematic effect on S1. So if the, the system is not uh, aligned or there is a misalignment, uh, you, would, you would expect to produce uh, nuclear recoils of the same energy, but you actually don't because the angles are slightly different. So alignment, it's, it's one of the systematic effects which may limit this measurement. This measurement. So extension of the detector and uh, precision of the alignment. And do you have a sense of the magnitude of that relative to this uncertainty you put here? Well, the detector, it's, uh, of course, it's uh, this way and you can correct, it's, it's a few centimeters and you have a resolution which is, uh, let's say, at the level of millimeter for Z and uh, let's say half a centimeter for, for X and Y. So this, uh, this systematics is, uh, is under control at the level of uh, millimeters. While the alignment, it's, it's a little bit more tricky because it's on a 3D uh, and we, we, we paid quite a lot of attention. We actually this this actually drove us crazy to, to have a proper alignment and uh, I, I could say that it's done at the level of uh, uh, half a centimeter or so but, but do you expect that to be kind of um, relatively negligible uh, in terms of uh, impacting r uh, compared to the statistical uncertainty yeah we, we, we made a lot of corrections yeah. to in order to make sure that we are Drive this down. we yeah. are exclu excluding any any spurious effect due to misalignment or to the systematics Okay, thanks. So I see there's a question from uh, Teresa. Yes, um, thank you very much for a, a very interesting talk. I wanted to ask on the comparison to a scene um, uh, result. So how does the, um, let's say the amplitude of the effect of a scene compare to your sensitivity? So it's of the same order or are you significantly better? Well, if you, if you look at scene, there, there is something strange in it. So basically you see the effect on S1 and you should see the opposite effect on S2 because the, the, the directionality signal will be an anti-correlation. So seeing an effect on S1 means that you should see something on S2, which they didn't. So what, he, what we did, it's, it was to repeat scene, but by improving very much the G1 and G2, so the, the gains of the system. So G1 is a factor of two better and G2 is a factor of eight better than, than seen in order to be sure that if this effect is real, we will never miss the counterpart on, on S2. And uh, the, the performance of our detector were uh, more than sufficient to, to disentangle this the effect of this, of this order of magnitude. So the detector was actually designed in order to be sure that if the, 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 the signal is here with this dimension, uh, we will see it. Okay, so your measurement is saying that uh, a difference of this size seen by a scene is not confirmed by your experiment. No, it is not. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately. Okay, thank you, we have to move on. Uh, thanks again, Luciano. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Gemma Testera, who will uh, tell us about uh, dark side 20K and the future liquid argon dark matter program. Okay. Um, hello to everybody. I think that you see my screen. Yeah, we do. So go ahead when you're ready. Okay, this is, this is a talk about the dark side uh, 20K program and the highlight of the future program. This is on behalf of the Global, Global Argon Dark Matter Collaboration, which is a community of uh, about 500 people that are collecting and joining all the expertise about low background liquid argon based detector with the goal, with the goal of making um, a search for the dark matter in the form of WIMP with a multi-step program. So building on uh, the already gained uh, experience, our immediate goal is the construction of the dark side 20K detector which will be located in Italy in the Gran Sasso uh, National Laboratory. So we are talking about a detector with a nominal exposure of uh, 200 tons per year so with uh, 20 tons of uh, fiducial volume. And why we are, we are fully committed in the, presently in the construction of this detector, we are also doing 
uh, feasibility studies for a future uh, detector, which is Argo, which is uh, likely located in, uh, at the Snow Lab, which will, will be uh, one order of magnitude bigger uh, in mass in the, in the fiducial volume. So um, increasing the sensitivity uh, in a consequent way. The expected the sensitivity of the dark side 20K uh, detector uh, is uh, shown uh, here in this, uh, in this slide. Uh, you see in this plot, uh, in the usual plane, uh, mass versus mass and cross section. Uh, the green region is the bottom corner of the region which is actually excluded by the existing experiment. And uh, you see by um, several lines uh, the expected the sensitivity of the uh, dark side 20K. So the blue dashed line is the nominal run with 200 ton per year. So with the analysis in the fiducial volume only, under the, our background design goal, which is order of 0.1 events of the ground in the dark matter search region. And also we have a, calculated the sensitivity to for, a, for a number of um, additional situations in which we use also the entire mass, not only the fiducial volume, including uh, a proper uh, background model. You see that we will, uh, we will uh, be very close to the neutrino floor and we will uh, possibly improve and complement uh, the sensitivity of the um, existing uh, and plan the experiment based on, uh, on Xeno. I really believe that the two technologies are really complementary. We, our detector will be based uh, as uh, the Xeno one on the concept of the dual phase uh, time projection chamber already the, described in which we will detect the scintillation light in the liquid phase and the scintillation light uh, originated by the ionization collected and extracted in the gas phase. This is absolutely uh, similar to what is done in Xenon experiment. What is a particular uh, important for argon is uh, the unique property of a pulse shape discrimination. The pulse shape discrimination is the possibility to recognize a nuclear recoil, which is a signal from electron recoil, which is the ground, um, through the uh, time profile uh, of a scintillation line and uh, through the ratio between S1 and S2. This, is, this uh, capability is particularly um, strong in argon due to the physical property of the uh, argon scintillation light and has been uh, demonstrated uh, in, in two of our running uh, smaller scale experiments, the dark side 50, which is a prototype of, of a dual phase TPC and also by DEEP, which is a single phase, and in DEEP in particular, um, using only a S1 signal, a pulse shape discrimination uh, touching the scale of a 10 to the 8 uh, has been uh, obtained, which is particularly relevant for um, our expectation in, in that side. Uh, if this is good for, for argon, uh, we have to take into account that uh, argon air has a drawback, uh, which is the presence of um, one isotope, uh, argon-39, which is radioactive. And uh, without uh, taking care of um, eliminating or reducing the radioactive isotope, isotope is very difficult to, to build a large-scale uh, detector based on argon. But the breakthrough was uh, the demonstration that we did in uh, Dark Side 50 uh, about the possibility to um, procure uh, argon from an underground source, which is uh, depleted by the radioactive isotope by, a by basically more than three order of magnitude. And uh, uh, you see in this plot uh, <clears throat> the measurement of the spectrum with, uh, without uh, the argon depleted and the factor of uh, 1,400 reduction of the contamination of uh, argon-39. Uh, assuming to get the same uh, um, reduction factor in uh, dark side 20K and including the excellent pulse shape discrimination, we expect to have uh, a background due to the residual uh, electron recoil below, below 0 0,1 events for the entire uh, exposure. 
But of course, for doing this, it is necessary that uh, one is able to scale up the procurement of, um, of the plated argon from the tens of uh, hundreds of kilograms that we did in our prototype to the hundreds of ton scale that is needed for a dark side 20K. And this is obtained by the combination of three facilities, which are Urania, Aria, and DART, that uh, perform the extraction with uh, an industrial plant able to uh, run at a level of uh, 300 kilos per day, so able to reach 100 ton in a reasonable number of uh, months. Uh, but by this urania plant, uh, followed by uh, another plant which is located uh, in Italy, in which the we will perform a cryogenic distillation of the strat of the argon to remove chemical impurities. And uh, another facility, which is located in Canfranc, on which part, uh, samples of uh, purified argon will be um, measured and, uh, and checked. And then the full amount will be shipped to Gran Sasso for uh, filling the dark side 20K uh, detector. So, uh, Taking into account the av availability of uh, the plated argon, the pulse shape discrimination, and including, of course, uh, all of the necessary selection of material and the handling procedure that is typical of uh, every uh, low background experiment, we end up with the neutrons as a the most dangerous background that we have to, um, to care of. In particular, uh, neutrons from, radi um, from alpha N reaction with uh, uh, the alpha coming from the contamination of material is uh, the most dangerous uh, source of the ground. And uh, to deal with uh, this background, of course, we need to build a veto detector around the sensitive uh, detector of, uh, of the TPC. Uh, taking all into account, uh, this is uh, uh, the design of a dark side 20K detector that uh, uh, is uh, mm, approved now and uh, we have included in our technical design uh, report, is uh, fully based on uh, argon. The sensitive part is underground argon, is the double phase uh, TPC, which is a three meter high and three, me three meter and half high, three meter and half uh, large, which uh, has an uh, octagonal uh, shape. This is the double phase TPC, uh, which is uh, um, read by uh, cryogenic CPM on top and bottom. We have about 21 square meter of uh, cryogenic CPM that read the TPC uh, light. The TPC is filled with argon of underground uh, source, and around the TPC, we still uh, have, again, uh, underground argon, which is a veto signal. So uh, all the detector is the sensitive part and the veto part are all based on underground argon. Double phase for the TPC, single phase for the veto detector. And everything is contained within um, a titanium vessel. This is a vessel, not, the, not the, uh, a cryostat, because around this vessel, we have uh, another bath of um, argon, but this time is argon of uh, atmospheric source. So it's not depleted from the radioactive isotope. And everything is uh, contained inside a big cryostat of a type used by protodune. So it's a membrane cryostat without vacuum with insulation realized with a particular, uh, with a particular form. Um, you see in this drawing um, a sketch of an optical plane uh, made by uh, CPM, which are, are on the top and on the bottom. And the special feature of this detector is that uh, we are minimizing the type and the amount of every material. The TPC is realized basically in acrylic, which is a material with, uh, which is, can be very radio poor. Pure acrylic for the anode and cathode, which is very transparent. And uh, in green, you see acrylic loaded with gadolinium. So uh, the gadolinium is embedded into the plastic material. 
Uh, gadolinium, we know, is very important for uh, detecting neutrons. So neutrons are thermalized uh, by interaction with um, hydrogen into the acrylic. Uh, they are captured by the gadolinium, and the light is detected by the IPM in the, in the Vito. You see some more details here about uh, the design of the detector. This is the external part of the TPC on which you see the IPM of the Vito. You see some tube in which a calibration source will be deployed. Uh, there is in green the inner part of the TPC on which you can see uh, grooves realized into the plastic that will be uh, painted with a special conductive uh, paint to realize the electric field. So we do not have a field cage realized by a metallic uh, material. We have uh, this group with a conducting paint and the resistor chain. And uh, all the surfaces, uh, both, both in the data and the TPC, will be covered by reflectors and uh, wavelength shifter to um, maximize the collection uh, of the light. Uh, yes, the working principle of the bit, of course, uh, is a uh, search for a coincidence of a WIMP-like event in the TPC and uh, an event in the Vito due to the capture of, um, of neutrons. And uh, for this, uh, we have uh, developed uh, this uh, new material, which is uh, uh, this acrylic loaded with gadolinium. And we have uh, uh, worked on two possible uh, receipts with two different uh, compounds of, uh, of acrylic. And both are working, and in particular, very important, they satisfy the radio purity requirements, which is not easy when we have uh, uh, gadolinium. You see one example of a laboratory scale uh, object that we have realized. And uh, take into account uh, the selection of the material, the Monte Carlo simulation, and the presence of uh, gadolinium at a level of 1% by weight, we expect uh, to have less uh, zero one uh, neutron event during uh, our uh, exposure time from uh, alpha N reaction. So we will control uh, uh, the most dangerous background. You see in this picture one example of a plate of acrylic loaded gadolinium realized in collaboration with an industry. And you see that it's not transparent. This is why we tend to use uh, on the anode and uh, on, the, on the cathode. Uh, we did a lot of uh, work and R&D about the developing of a cryogenic uh, CIPM. This R&D is concluded. The production, the full procurement of the CIPM is now in progress. Here there is a collection of results. There is a paper that is uh, in preparation. We have, we have measured many properties. Uh, in, in and very important also, we have included all this property in our Monte Carlo to predict uh, um, the light response, uh, taking into account uh, of the response also of, um, of the CIPM, including uh, direct cross-talk, correlated avalanche, and all the instrumental effect about the CIPM that we could, uh, we could measure. We have developed uh, several technologies to assemble uh, uh, tiles uh, of uh, five by five uh, a square centimeter into a large matrix uh, that then should build the large uh, optical planes of the TPC. You see uh, three examples of a different way to assemble uh, uh, mechanically the different uh, object. The last one is our baseline solution in which we have a very thin uh, object that uh, is uh, collecting 16 uh, tiles, and we read this uh, uh, summing uh, the, uh, the signal of four tiles. Uh, you see here the example of a signal to noise ratio in the photoelectron peak, but uh, in the photoelectron uh, spectrum that we have measured. It is, I want to underline that this is a 100 centimeter square object read as a, read as a single channel. So I think it's quite a big, uh, uh, quite a big sensor. Um, in addition to the search for dark matter through um, the combination of S1 and S2 signal that uh, and the sensitivity that I've shown before was referred to this standard analysis, of course we are uh, studying also the sensitivity into the low mass region in which only the S2 signal um, is used because it's larger than S1. 
we already performed this analysis and published this analysis for the prototype dark side 50. And recently, we are improving the calibration of the dark side 50 to the lower uh, energy part that this will be really about to predict the sensitivity of the of dark side. And also through the S2 only signal, uh, we have some nice sensitivity also to uh, supernova uh, events. So if they will arrive, of course, uh, it will be, they will be very interesting signal to, to look at. So in conclusion, uh, the Global Argon Dark Matter Collaboration has concluded the R&D phase for the construction of the dark side detector. We are entering into the construction phase. 2022 is really uh, an important year in which the main part of the detector will start to be built. We have developed a long list of technologies that will be implemented into dark side 20K. And we are also studying how we can scale up to the larger uh, argon, argon detector. We expect the data taking in 2025, and the, it will last nominally for, uh, for 10 years. And this is a, a collage of uh, all the institute, uh, maybe, probably not of all the one, the most part of the institute to participate into that site. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Gemma. Uh, are there any questions? Again, we we'll leave you all people thinking. Um, so you, you mentioned um, Argo and plans beyond Darkside 20K at the start. Could you comment on um, what kind of things are in development uh, to improve the sensitivity of um, Argo beyond just uh, the increased exposure? Uh, we are we are trying to understand if uh, um, the one key point is really to understand is that the depression factor that uh, uh, we have uh, we had in dark side uh, 50 is really the limiting factor or if, if we can do better because we have some uh, hints that in dark side 50 we had some contamination so in principle we could have um, a better reduction of argon 39 and in this will be really important uh, both in dark side 50, but also uh, even more important when you increase uh, uh, the mass of, uh, of your detector. So this is a key point on which we are, uh, we are uh, working on. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions? I don't see any. Last chance. Oh, okay, then uh, thanks, Jan, for this uh, update. Uh, we'll move to the next presentation, which is uh, by Teng Ma, who will give us an update of a new proposed uh, experiment at DAISY. So, you can see your slides. Yep, the full screen now. Can, can... I think you're muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead when you're ready. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, today uh, I will talk about uh, use the new type of dump to uh, search a new fix at the LUX. Yeah, based on this work. Um, um, we know that uh, in the intense um, background fields, uh, some innovation. Uh, uh, some non preparation and nonlinear uh, process uh, will happen. Uh, for example, the famous uh, spontaneous uh, pair production. Uh, if the uh, external field is very strong, it will uh, drag out a pair of electrons uh, from the uh, vacuum. And when the uh, when, when photon inject in the uh, latter background, it will uh, decay into a pair of electrons. Uh, this is a nonlinear Bretovilla process. And uh, uh, if we cross symmetry this process, we found that uh, uh, the nonlinear complex sc uh, scattered process can also happen in the uh, strong background field. Um, one, of, uh, one of the uh, main, main purpose of the Alakis is to detect 
uh, this non-linear and non-privation uh, strong QD process. Uh, in this um, experiment, uh, a lot of high energy electron is produced and uh, this uh, high energy uh, electron injected into the, the uh, very intense ladder background. And uh, then um, uh, some uh, non-provision uh, non-linear process will happen. And uh, um, uh, um, at the back of the ladder uh, electron, uh, that electron assist, uh, system, uh, some uh, magnetic field in, in, in imposed to separate the uh, electron and the proton. So um, um, uh, they, they can detect the proton to uh, uh, measure the nonlinear uh, bright wheeler process. And uh, um, in this experiment, uh, they can uh, block uh, the electron charge to, to measure the um, um, hard photon spectrum uh, to provide the nonlinear compound scattering. We found that the um, nonlinear compound scattering uh, can be a, a very good method to efficiently produce a large flux of hard photon. Um, um, in the electron and ladder system, is the electron injected into the ladder background. Uh, since the ladder background is very strong, the electron uh, will strongly and uh, uh, nonlinear interact with the ladder background uh, to uh, efficiently inject a lot of hard photon. Uh, at the same, same time, these hard photon uh, uh, weakly interact to the ladder background, so they can uh, free, uh, uh, free, uh, free stream uh, in the ladder, uh, ladder background with, without any loss. Uh, so comparing with the traditional uh, uh, thin dump, um, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, new new uh, this new dump is very efficient to produce a hard photon. So we call this uh, this system as the optical dump. Actually, uh, this uh, system is very efficient uh, to produce the uh, uh, the photon. To photon, uh, we can look at the photon number, which uh, proportional to pass length tail divided by the uh, time scale of the uh, nonlinear common uh, common scattering. If the light background is very intense and strong, the time scale of the uh, nonlinear, uh, nonlinear common scary will, will be very short. So uh, in the system, uh, a lot of uh, uh, photon uh, will be uh, emitted from the uh, electron. Um, the nonlinear and non perturbation effect can not only enhance the number of the um, uh, photon, but also enhance the energy of the photon. Uh, uh, this plot is the analytic uh, result of the uh, photon spectrum uh, emitted from the uh, electron. Uh, we can find that the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the photon number and energy increase as the, uh, the intense pr uh, parameter increase. The heat is the intense parameter, which uh, parameterizes the uh, intensity of the ladder background. Um, to uh to produce as more as possible hard photon, uh, the, this this electron uh, laser background should satisfy this condition. Uh, here the inverse of the laser frequency should much smaller than the scale of nonlinear common scattering. Uh, this is because uh, we need to make sure that the ladder the ladder field can be uh, can be treated as the uh, plain uh, uh, plain background. Uh, in order to uh, uh, produce uh, as, ma as many as uh, as many as possible uh, number uh, photon number from the electron, the uh, the, uh, the the laser path should uh, uh, bigger than the uh, time scale of the nonlinear common scary because the photon number is proportional to the TL uh, over the uh, tau NLCS. Uh, uh, however, um, when the when the uh, hard photon uh, uh, travel in the uh, less background, it can it can also uh, decay into a pair of electron through the nonlinear bright wheeler process. Uh, so in order to uh, suppress this suppress uh, this process, the time scale of nonlinear bright wheeler uh, 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 bright wheeler process should be uh, bigger than the pass length. So this process, so uh, uh, a lot uh, so uh, 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 the hard photon uh, the loss of hard photon can be suppressed. 
We found that this this optical dam system can be realized at the Lucas uh, Lucas uh, have uh, all the ingredient to realize. And uh, uh, in this uh, uh in Lux in Lux the, the typical ladder frequency is around 0.5 eV, and the uh, ladder pass length is uh, from uh, 10 to 100 uh, milliseconds. The uh, intense uh. The uh, tense parameter is uh, three point two, and uh, uh, the en the energy of the electron is uh, sixteen point five GeV. Then we can calculate the time scale of the uh nonlinear uh, brand uh, uh, uh process. We found that time scale is uh, ten to four to uh, ten to six nanosecond. The nonlinear common uh scattering uh, uh time scale uh, is around uh, uh, ten. Uh, five second. So we can find that the uh, the photon number uh, number emitted from the electron is bigger than that. So this is a very efficient, uh, more efficiently than the uh, traditional thin dump. And uh, uh, we can find that the uh, the nonlinear uh, better valor time scale is longer than the uh, ladder uh, ladder time scale. So uh, this uh, uh, this uh, this process is suppressed. So it can guarantee that uh, the hard photon uh, cannot uh, decay into a pair of uh, electron in the ladder background. Here is the uh, photon spectrum for different uh, uh, phase of ladder. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the black line is the uh, phase one ladder, and uh, the blue line is the uh, uh, phase zero ladder. Uh, the difference between these this two phases is the uh, is, uh, power of the ladder. And the, uh, the, the red line is a spectrum from the uh, simple damp. We can find that the, the optic damp at the, uh, at the lux can uh, more efficiently uh, to produce the hard photon than the traditional damp. So with this, uh, uh, a lot of hard photon, uh, we can use them to uh, uh, produce the, the axial like particle. Uh, which cap with the photon through the uh, dimension five operate. Um, after the hard photon uh, produced from the optic damp, uh, we uh, added, uh, we put, we import uh, photon damp to absorb uh, all the hard photon to produce the egg, uh, to produce the egg, uh, 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 axion like particles through the Bram curve process, and. Uh, 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 we uh, we also uh, impose the magnetic field to uh, remove the um, uh, uh, the charge particle background, and then the air uh, decay into a pair of photon. Uh, we use the uh, uh, photon detect to uh, to detect a pair a pair of uh, photon uh, final state to 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 probe to probe the uh, axial like particle, and the back at the back of the Photon detector, we, uh, we also Im uh, import the muon detector to remove the uh, muon background. However, in this uh, setup, um, uh, we can uh, we can use we can also use the electron. Uh, there's another uh, option to uh, produce the app. Uh, that is, we can use the uh, electron a lot of electron beam to directly uh, 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 cut with the dump to produce app. Uh, however, in, uh, in, in this case, uh, a lot of down, uh, app can be pro can be produced, but uh, but its background is uh, very huge, uh, which will uh, weaken uh, which will uh, max uh, max the uh, app detection and challenge. Uh, in this table, we compare it, uh, we compare the two 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 options. This column is. Uh, uh, the photon number emitted from the uh, from uh, one electron. Uh, now we can we can use we can use this uh, number to uh, uh, get the information of the uh, app number uh, app number event because the app number event is proportional to the hard photon emitted from one, uh, one electron. Uh, this is the photon number uh, from the optical phase one and the photon number from uh, Phase zero. This is the uh, optical number from the phase phase five. We found that uh, uh, 
in the uh in the traditional uh being dump uh, uh the event number is uh, uh really uh enhanced it, it is uh but however it is uh, ju just uh, uh at the same order as the uh, op uh optical uh dump face back uh it is uh uh man or the magnitude big that uh uh face zero uh, uh, uh optical dump but uh, but that background is very different. Um, yeah, uh, for the optical dump dump case, uh, the background is very small, and uh, uh, we found that it can uh, can be efficiently uh, removed by the uh, current uh, detector technology. But for the traditional uh, beam dump, uh, its uh, uh, background is too automatic than the uh, uh, Lux's uh, 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 Optical dump. Uh, for yeah, uh, when you yeah, uh, attacking, we found that the background event is when is uh, bigger than uh, one hundred. So there's a huge background. Uh, you can find that the huge background definitely uh, weak the the air protection uh, uh, for the beam dump. So uh, in, so uh, in summary, the optical dump uh, is uh, have a very strong detection ability uh, in the. Uh, in the app, uh, that uh, 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 more better, uh, more better than the traditional beam dump. So, minutes, uh, okay. so uh, the background, uh, as mentioned, we we use the giant to do uh, we use giant to simulate simulate the background. Uh, I found that there are two or three kind of background. The first one is the charged particle. Uh, the uh, electron muon pile, and uh, we can, uh, as we said before, we can uh, remove that, that by the strong magnetic fields. And uh, a second kind of background is uh, is a uh, is a uh, is a neutron, uh, which can be uh, which can be misidentified as the uh, fake photon. So there there are two kind of uh, fake photon events. Uh, first one is the two neutron is misidentified. Uh, find as the two two photon. Um, uh, uh, we use giant simulation, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the event number uh, can be expressed uh, expressed in this form uh, for for one year uh, the attacking. Here the f n two gamma is the uh, uh, probability uh, to uh, probability to misidentify the neutron uh, to electron. Uh, the R cell is the uh, rejection power of the uh, detection. Uh, the uh, a second uh, uh, fake uh, fake photon uh, background is is that uh, by neutron uh, plus one uh, uh, photon is misidentified as the uh, two photon uh, express uh, we uh, we get a similar express and the dominant background is the real photon background uh, it's uh, a background event is uh, can be expressed uh, in this form uh, here we suppose that the uh, the probability to detect a two photon uh, background is a, uh, po a poison back uh, is a poison probability. We found that if the RCL and FN two gamma uh, smaller than uh, ten to uh, minus three, uh, this uh, all this background is uh, event is smaller than one. So uh, so it's uh, uh, we can uh, and this this requirement uh, can be achieved by the current uh, technology. So uh, in this setup, we can suppose that the, we can certainly uh, suppose that the background is free. Um, so if uh, if the background is free, uh, this is the uh, sensitivity project in uh, 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 parameter space. The the blue uh, the blue line and the black line is for the face band, face face uh, face zero and face band uh, optical damp uh, uh, setup. Here is the uh, experimental parameter. Uh, this is the electron energy, and the 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 the, the, the number of the electron in the lattice, uh, uh, in one bunch is around a point, a point uh, ten, uh, 10 to nine. The, uh, this is the bunch number for one year it's around uh, 10, uh, 10, uh, 10 to seven. Uh, this is a uh, photon dump mass uh, uh, limit uh, because the background is very clean, so the, even the uh, short, uh, short dump, uh, short uh, photon dump, uh, uh, the background can be uh, uh, 
uh, the background can be uh, uh, can be under control. So this is this shutdown is a key point to 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 make the uh, uh, optical dam have a very good uh, probability for the short life of the LP. Uh, LV is the uh, the decay volume length, the radius of the detected limit, and uh, we also impose the uh, threshold energy of the uh, of the but uh, of the uh, final state photon that's uh, 0.5 GeV. Uh, this uh, this this great great region is the exclu excluded region, so we can find that that uses the optic damp the lattice have a uh, very good uh, best uh, good uh, probability uh, uh, probability uh, in uh, in the uh, app. Okay, sorry. Uh, we propose a new type of damp to produce uh, like a uh, hard photon which is uh, optical damp. And you use this damp, uh, the Lexus can uh, probe the, uh, the, 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 uh, the unexplored uh, primary space of the app. Uh, of app. So uh, uh, also this optical damp can be also implement, uh, implement in the other, uh, some other experiment. So we need to uh, exploit uh, for the, so, oh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any questions? So uh, one thing I didn't uh, quite catch mm -hmm. from your talk is that is the status of this experiment. Is it is it uh, approved? Is it in uh, looking for funding? Is it under construction? And could yeah, so if you could comment on that, and then also. What is the time scale for phase zero and phase one compared to phase two and NA62, which essentially this is a competitive experiment uh, yeah. for? Uh, so, so, so sorry. So, oh. so it's a two-part question, really. But what, uh -huh. what's the state current status of the experiment? Is it funded? Is it in the construction? And then could you comment on what the planned time scale is for phase yeah, zero? Yeah, uh, rather, I think it's a rather three year. Yeah, actually, Lexis is, plan, is planning to set up the experiment based on our proposal. Yeah. So to, 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 what was that, sorry, to build it within and have it running within three years, was that? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, after three years, they, they, they can, you know, like get the data. So. so it'll be similar, in, and then how long will that run for, a few, uh, one or two years, or? Uh, uh, you, you mean, uh, yeah, for many years. So yeah. After, after, after three years. Yeah. yeah, so the phase one will be a few years run, of running or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's similar-ish timescales to phase two, roughly. Yes, yeah. but the, the key point is that uh, we don't know if, if the phase is considered, the, this project uh, curve, project curve, uh, we, we don't know if they consider the background. You know, actually, in our, in the, uh, for our case, we, 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 we totally, uh, you know, think about, uh, consider the background and uh, we, we know how to eliminate it. But I, I, we, we don't know how, how the failure, you know, if they uh, consider the background and uh, um, this is, uh, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Luciano, I see you have a question. Yeah, I have a quick question about the, the, the Gen 4 simulation. So, so you, you said that you estimate the background by, by simulation, but did you have a simulation which, uh, uh, let's say, simulates the, the full story? So starting from the electron beam, or you have uh, an initial uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, this, gamma? This simulated the, the electron beam down case. Yeah, so the background is uh, for, you know, uh, under this condition, the the background for the uh, the beam dam is around uh, uh, three three hundred for one year that that taking. Okay, so so we have the simulation hand to end, so from the from the electron beam down to the to the full propagation of the of the products. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I don't see any other questions. So uh, thanks again for the presentation and we'll move okay. on to the next talk, which is going to be uh, on the status of the Deep 3600 experiment uh, from Susanata Seth. Uh, how, how can I stop this? Uh, so 
Uh, no. Ross, maybe you can help with stopping the sharing if uh, Tim, I can't find. Oh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Oh, Sorry. There Hello, so Hello. can you see my slide? Yes, you can see your slides. You can go ahead if you're ready. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present our results in this symposium. I'll be talking about status of the DEEP 3600 experiment today. Here is the outline of my talk. I'll give brief overview of our detector. Then I will discuss about the pulse safe discrimination and background events. I will show the latest dark matter search uh, results for various scenario. Then I will be talking about ongoing activities. Basically, I will focus on analysis and hardware updates. And uh, finally, I'll summarize the main points from my talk. So the DEEP acronym basically stands for dark matter experiment using argon pulse safe discrimination. This is a direct detection of dark matter experiment. It uh, utilizes a single phase liquid argon detector. It is located in Snow Lab underground facility in Canada. The 3600 experiment collected data for dark matter from November 2016 to March 2020. Now it is undergoing detector upgrades. This is the picture from our last collaboration meeting, which was in hybrid mode. And we had about 95 uh, researchers from nine countries working in this collaboration. So in that slide, I have uh, shown the cross-sectional view of our detector, and this is the experimental side. So we have 3.3 tons of liquid argon target, which is contained in a spherical acrylic vessel. And this detector is uh, optimized to acquire the scintillation light produced by argon-14 nuclear decal, which is expected to produce uh, after interaction with wind candidate of dark matter. The uh, inner part of this acrylic vessel is uh, coated with TPV wavelength sifter that sifts the scintillation photons peaked at 128 nanometer to visible wavelength. After that, those photons travel to acrylic vessel and light guides and then detected by the PMTs. There are two, 255 inward facing PMTs, each has very high quantum efficiency. And uh, you can see from this figure that the region between these uh, light guides are basically uh, filled by high density polyethylene and styrofoam that works as thermal insulator as well as passive neutron shielding. Now, uh, this whole setup is kept within steel, uh, stainless steel spherical vessel, which is submerged within water tank. Now, why we have chosen this argon liquid? Because it has a good scintillation light tilt. It is uh, transparent to its own scintillation light. When incident uh, radiation falls on argon or by ionization or excitation procedure, ultimately it will produce eczema in singlet or triplet state. The lifetime difference between these two states basically help us to differentiate between, between nuclear decoil and electron decoil events. Here are the typical uh, pulse from electron recoil events, and this is for nuclear recoil events. For nuclear recoil events, uh, more lights produced in earlier time window, whereas for electron recoil, more late light can be found. Now I'll be talking about the pulse safe discrimination uh, procedure we have using. So this is the pulse from argon 39 beta decays. We have a very good model that uh, accounts for liquid uh, argon scintillation physics like uh, uh, singlet, triplet light, lifetime and also the detector response like uh, PMT after pulsing and delayed uh, or uh, we can say that TPB, uh, TPB emission light uh, in our model. And this model basically very accurate to describe the whole shape we can found, we can see from our uh, detector. There we have done the comparison between model and the data. Very recently, uh, we have also studied four PhD parameter using this argon 39 beta decays. This is uh, one of the PhD parameter, which is called F prompt. The numerator is the scintillation light within the narrow time window, whereas denominator is scintillation light in the wider time window. Black points here is from the data, whereas the gray line is from the model. And this line corresponds to 90% nuclear recoil acceptance. Besides that, we also predict the leakage probability of electron recoil within the nuclear recoil region as a function of uh, energy. And these are for four PhD parameters. 
full PhD parameter has uh, have a excellent performance for detection of electron decoys. Beside that, we also observe that uh, detection of detector effects uh, like uh, PMT after passing will uh, improve the effectiveness of the PhD algorithm we are using. In the slide, I have shown the electromagnetic back backgrounds data we observed from our detector. So the gray region is from that data. But this colored are the Monte Carlo simulation for various sources. And this black line is corresponding to the sum of the all sources. So we can say that our there is a very good agreement between the background model we have and with uh, the data we observe. Now I'll be talking about the neutron background. So as we know that for these kinds of experiments, uh, there are normally two kinds of neutron background. The cosmogenic neutron background is coming from uh, the interaction with muon interaction, uh, atmospheric muon interaction with a detector. So for this purpose, we are, uh, for, so to reduce these kinds of background, we are basically performing our experiment in snow lab. So this is a good uh, or significant amount of uh, reduction of muon flux. And uh, beside that, we also tag the muon induced student curve signal in water tank. These are the muon veto here. And radiogenic background basically coming for alpha N interaction. These alpha are coming from various component of detector. And uh, to mitigate these kinds of background, we uh, basically estimate the neutron flux and energy spectra. Beside that, we also do the neutron capture analysis. So neutrons are expected to be thermalized within liquid argon or acrylic, so it will produce high energy gamma rays. So we tag the neutron deco uh, recoil event closely followed by high energy electron recoil event. So these kinds of analysis basically help us to constrain the neutron backgrounds for our detector. Now I'll be talking about the alpha backgrounds. So alpha, uh, these backgrounds, uh, this is the surface alpha background. This is coming from the inner surface of uh, our detector or we can say in a surface of the acrylic vessel, the source is 210 polonium alpha decay. The black points are from the data, where the colored one are from Monte Carlo simulation for various source position. And we have a very good agreement with data and our model. Because these, uh, these kinds of backgrounds are coming from surface, we can put the fiducial card and we can constrain these kinds of backgrounds. So this is the leakage probability of such kinds of events in WIM part Y as a function of uh, con uh, contain liquid argon mass. This is the fiducial card position. So after applying the fiducial card, uh, most of the alpha backgrounds is coming from the neck region of our detector. In the neck region, there are flow guides. These kinds of alpha backgrounds are produced due, uh, from 210 polonium uh, alpha decay again and on the acrylic uh, surface of flow guide. The, uh, these kinds of background, uh, actually this alpha decay produce significant backgrounds at low energy region due to shadowed or degraded alpha decays. And these kinds of background basically has a tendency to reconstruct within uh, fiducial volume. And we also observe these kinds of nature from our Monte Carlo simulation. But we have a very good optical model in which we assume the surface of flow guide uh, uh, are coated basically with a thin liquid argon layer. And using that model, we also con uh, reconstruct uh, the EPROM distribution from Monte Carlo, which is very consistent with our data. Now I'll be talking about the dust alpha background. So these kinds of background is coming from uranium and thorium decay chain present on dust particulates, uh, which have been observed within our detector. Dust particle can shadow the scintillation light or degrade the energy of alpha particles. So black points here do we observe uh, uh, from our data. And these are all uh, for various dust sizes. And the purple one basically sum up all simulations. So there is a good agreement with uh, data and the Monte Carlo simulation we have. Now I'll be talking about the sensitivity of our detector to WIMP search. Uh, so this is based on first year data set. This has 231 live test data. After applying the background rejection card within the WIMP ROI DJN, there is no, back, uh, no event has been found. Uh, so, uh, uh, that leads us to draw, draw these kinds of uh, exclusion plot. Uh, so about 100 GB WIMP mass, we can exclude the spin independent WIMP nuclear cross section above 3.9 into 10 to the power minus 5 centimeters square. 
at 90% confidence level, and this is using the standard HALO model. The further sensitivity is current, uh, further improvement is the sen sensitivity is currently limited by NIC and dust alpha backgrounds, and we are upgrading our uh, detector. I will discuss uh, that later in my slide. The same result has also been reinterpreted with more general non-relativistic effective field theory framework, and that can explore the isospin violating coupling. So this is from our uh, detector, and we can say that this gives one or leading sensitivity for xenophobic dark matter at uh, this high mass region. Uh, now I'll be talking about the Planck scale mass multiscatter dark matter. This paper just published last week in PRL. Uh, so dark matter candidate which has interaction cross section of the order of 10 to the power minus 25 centimeters squared or mass and mass uh, greater than 10 to the power 12 GB that can lose a negligible amount of uh, energy in uh, scattering with earth nuclei so that they will be able to reach uh, underground detector and produce uh, event signature. But this signature will be expected to be different from that will be produced by WIMP candidate of dark matter. They basically co contains the multiple uh, nuclear recoil scattering information. So they will have the um, multiple peaks and uh, they expected to have low F from. These are two simulated uh, photo electron time distribution for our detector. For this study, basically our three years data set has been analyzed and we didn't find any event uh, within the ROI that leads us to put constraint on uh, the mass of uh, this uh, mass, uh, which is uh, from 8.3 into 10 to the power 6 uh, GB to 1.2 into 10 to the power 19 GB and cross section is within this region. So this high mass region has been able to explored because of the uh, larger um, larger cross-sectional area of our detector. So we can say that this is the first experiment, uh, experiment which uh, he has been able to uh, reach the Planck scale sensitivity due to its large uh, detector site. Four minutes. Now I'll, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I'll be uh, talking about the upcoming uh, results. So we are currently, uh, um, analyzing our three years data set. So we are going to have our next result with 802 live days data. And currently 80% of data is blind since January 2018. We are going to implement the multivariate analysis also to reduce the NIC and dust alpha background. Here is one of the comparison between a NIC alpha events and the nuclear events. So these kinds of analysis will help us to identify these kinds of background. And the main important thing is that detector upgrades. So we are especially doing this uh, for remove NIC and dust alpha backgrounds. We are going to install one vacuum jacket stainless steel pipe through the NIC region of our detector that will remove the liquid argon from uh, the acrylic vessel. Then they allow filtration and it will fill the detector with clean argon. And to, uh, so that, that will help us to reduce the dust alpha events and to remove the NIC alpha events will allow uh, warming of this snake region. So that will remove the possibility of formation of liquid film or drop in that region. And this is the flow guide. Previously, there is no coating on this flow guide, but we are going to coat the flow guide surface with slow wavelength shifter. For this purpose, pyrene has been selected and that will help us to bring our alpha events in the lower a prompt region. So uh, that will help us also to remove the alpha background. So characterization of this low wavelength shifter can be found in this ar archive preprints. So we have submitted that paper in NIM also. Uh, so I'll be summarize the main points. So deep 3600 detector has an excel excellent performance uh, discrimination, uh, excellent passive discrimination performance. And we have uh, basically, uh, 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 studied multiple dark matter scenarios. Deep detect, uh, 3600 data collected data till March 2020. We are currently analyzing our data and MBA techniques we are going to implement to reduce the alpha backgrounds. Detector upgrade uh, would uh, allow to reduce uh, the degraded alpha background uh, significantly. We are expecting to fill our detector and start data in summer of this year. 
Besides that, we are performing other physics analysis also like uh, solar neutrino absorption measurement and precision measurement of specific activity of argon-39 in atmospheric argon. So I'd like to thank all my uh, deep collaborators for their cooperation and also all of you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, let's see, we have a question from uh, Teresa. Yes, uh, thank you for the nice talk. So we are all really looking forward to your 800 days of data. So I wanted to ask if you have some estimation of when approximately we might uh, learn about it? Uh, no, we are just, uh, uh, I mean, we are currently analyzed, started analyzing our new simulation data. So I think we'll finish, we'll try to finish in a few months or, but I do not have actually just timeline, but we'll try to finish our analysis with the new Monte Carlo result we have currently and then probably compared with our data and then. Okay, so a few months, let's say. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. A few months. Thank you. And so um, for the future run that uh, the data taking starting in the summer, do you have an estimate of the expected live days that you will uh, take overall for uh, uh, No, I, I think uh, till now, I, I can't remember that we have decided for how long, you were asking how long we'll run. Yeah. No. I uh, sorry. No. <laughs> okay. I don't have um, particular answer. Okay, no problem. Any other questions? So if not, I just have one minor one actually on um, slide thirteen, just my understanding. So this, uh, if I'm understanding the the plot here uh, correctly, so you have the black line, which is your well. Okay, let me ask, let me ask the question more directly. I, I didn't quite understand what the difference was between the black and the blue. So could you clarify for me? Uh, uh, sorry, I think, uh, I, uh, sorry, I can't remember this. Uh, you didn't hear what I said or what was that, sorry? No, I can't uh, remember this, uh, what type of scaling we have done uh, for this paper. At this moment, uh, I can't remember this. Art actually. Okay, so is, is the black the the the, the primary um, limit from from deep thirty six hundred? Yeah, the... I think both from deep thirty six hundred there is some kinds of uh, scaling has been done. Yeah, probably the uh, this one may be the primary one, but uh, okay. I, I just can't remember this exactly what kinds of scaling at the time has been. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, I can check in the paper. That's fine. All right, thanks a lot. Um, I don't see any other questions, so uh, I can thank you again for the presentation, um, and also thanks to all the speakers uh, in today's uh, session. That that brings us to the end of the session. So thanks to the speakers and thanks for everyone else for participating, and hopefully see you at other sessions uh, later this week. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. Good evening.